Hey church, it's uh, Pastor Jacob, just uh, here going through part of our membership class. This week we'll be going through just a theological discussion of what we believe as a church. Here the English ministry, Living Hope Raleigh, we do not believe you know anything majorly different from the Korean ministry. We're under the same umbrella of FKBC, so the English ministry, we are our own congregation, but we overall submit to the authority and uh, senior leadership of our church, and that includes the teaching, um, not just because we want to be unified as one organization, we do, but mainly because we believe that this is clearly what the Bible teaches. And so what do we believe? As a member of our church, uh, you'll do your very best to ascribe to these things, not because, oh, PJ said this, or, you know, the KM senior pastor said that, but because it's biblical. This is basically a, um, a, a distillation of uh, the Southern Baptist faith and message, which you can find on sbc.net. But again, it's not just because we're Southern Baptists, it's because we truly believe that this is what the Bible says. I mean, I've pretty much come to these conclusions after a study of Scripture, and also reading, you know, the, the faith and message, it lines right up. And so I'll never say, oh, you know, you need to be reformed, which actually I fall in line with. But, you know, as we read Scripture, those conclusions that we come to line right up with a lot of that school of theology. And so, you know, we're not starting with these historical creeds and whatnot, but it's awesome how the conclusions that we come to most of the time line right up with what's already there. And so we're going through what's already there because we see that our conclusions line up with these things. But here we are. What we believe, part one. This was originally in two parts. Uh, originally, the membership class was in three three week class, but we offer it every month. And so we're like, oh, we just do it in two weeks, uh, probably be a better thing. And we can get through this quickly, but not as in depth as we used to, but fairly quickly. So we'll spread it into theology for the first week and history and polity, basically structure of our church in the second week. But here we go. What we believe, uh, part one, again, there's going to be two parts done in this first session. Part one, the Bible. And so we believe that the Bible was written by people who were inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's the revelation of God to man. It's inerrant, true, and trustworthy. It's a testimony to Christ, who was the focus of divine revelation. And so here we are. We don't think it's just, you know, a bunch of words penned down by people uh, who were humanitarians and wanted the best for, you know, humankind and whatnot. And they saw that there was too much war, too much violence or this or that. They just wanted people to be better people. We believe that people were inspired by the Holy Spirit. Well, what does that mean? Does it mean that, you know, oh, they closed their eyes and they just kind of moved around the pen? Or does it mean, looking back on life, they wrote things down that they realized, wow, the Spirit was really moving during that time? Or as they wrote about, you know, as Paul would write on lofty matters of theology and, and the nature and character of God and, and the atoning work of Jesus Christ, his very thought process had been so shaped by the influence of the Holy Spirit on his life and his study of the Word that what we get is Holy Writ. And so, and also we believe that the, the books that we have are the books that we need to have. Uh, holy inspired, these things came together and they all affirm each other, which is really amazing about the Bible. The revelation of God to man is what we need to know. It's inerrant. Here's the thing, there are little grammatical errors here and there. You have to know that about the text. If you look at the manuscripts, if you've ever been so fortunate to see, not the originals, because barely any of those exist, but, you know, a copy of a copy of a copy, you'll see that the, the, the grammar is terrible. It's like one long sentence. There's no punctuations. There's not even spaces between words. And you can make, you know, little mistakes here and there, but the message that we have is true and trustworthy. It's what we need. It points to Jesus Christ. 
not every single word on every single scroll or every single parchment is about Jesus, but the overall picture. It's amazing how, you know, these 66 books in hundreds uh, of times in different places and all these amazing situations would come together with one central revelation, and that is Jesus Christ. When we think of God, there is one true living God. He created the universe and rolls over it. <laughs> <laughs> my, my Canadian came out over it, uh, over it. He is infinitely holy and powerful, yet knowable and approachable, perfectly just and all-knowing, yet all-loving and merciful. God exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we believe that Scripture points to, you know, the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but this concept of the triune God is... God in three persons, Father, Spirit, Son. We know that Father, you know, sovereign over all creation, uh, the Creator God, we know, the one who loves us and adopts us as sons. We know Jesus, God in the flesh, the one who was sacrificed for our sins, the one who modeled the perfect life of following and being literally God among us. We know the Holy Spirit, the one who empowers us, who keeps us, who sealed us for the very day of redemption. These types of things, you know, God reveals himself. And it's interesting, certain instances in Scripture, you see all three aspects, all three persons of God in the same place. We try to wrap our head around the Trinity. We go crazy. We have all these analogies and whatnot. They're, none of them are perfect. And I think there's a reason for that. The whole thing about faith it stretches us. You know, there's a reason why we can't fully grasp it or fully see it right in front of us because if we could, then it wouldn't be faith. And we know that God is unfathomable. He is knowable, but, you know, we, we can't describe him in such a way where we can put him in a box. And so he gives us these ways to relate to him and then blows our minds away by being, you know, all three in the same place at once. It's crazy yet amazing. When we think about people, the next slide, people are the special creation of God, made in God's image. They're engendered, innocent at creation, fallen at birth. Every single person needs to be saved. Every person possesses full dignity and is worthy of love. They're very important things. As a Christian, I think a lot of us, especially those of us who are really well educated in terms of formal Christian thought and theology, a lot of times our anthropology is very weak. We don't really think about what the God actually says about people. But if you think about it, the special creation of God, it's the only aspect of creation of which it is written in Holy Scripture made in the image of God. Let us make them in our image, says the Godhead, the host, the heavenly host. And so you see this unique stamp that every single person throughout history has had. That should change the very way we look at people around us, should it not? You know, even if we don't agree with a certain person's ideology, even though that person is not Christian, they're made in the image of God and they needed to be treated with value, dignity, and respect. That's why as Christians, it's impossible to be a racist. Think about that. Can you hold one race of people above the other if they're all made in the image of God? You cannot. That's why the act of murder, it's such a heinous sin. Why? Because you're marring, you're destroying the image of God. And so if we think of these things and, and just really hold it true to our theology and what we believe, you know, we won't even have to say, okay, I'm part of the civil rights movement. It's just built into who we are. And it starts with us believing the Word of God is the Word of God, seeing what it says about His people, and acting out of that, not out of what the whim of, you know, not out of the whim of something in society at the current moment. As Christians, we're not woke. We've already been awakened. <laughs> Think about that. Next slide about salvation. We read, no salvation apart from personal faith in Christ Jesus as Lord. Here's the thing, okay? We're, we're not all about, okay, we need to be dogmatic about things. We're just looking at what Scripture says. 
if you're part of a church or part of a tradition that's all about you know human choice and human responsibility, there's a lot of good in that. But you have to realize is the whole work of salvation is not just about okay, we're saving people from a terrible situation, which you know part of it is. But the bigger aspect of everything, it's about God's glory. And so if you think about, okay, in the act of salvation, how does God get the most glory? Who is the Savior? Who is the mover? Who saw people in a broken and dead state and decided to act on it? Thus bringing people to places, yes, where they're restored and, and redeemed and they're living in such a way where they're experiencing the most possible joy. But what brings about all of that? And that is the act of God. Salvation starts with the act of God. The very fact that it was Jesus Christ sacrificed willingly on a cross, not our own. And so when we talk about these big theological words, regeneration, justification, sanctification, glorification, you know, no, yeah, there are theological terms, but there's a reason for that. Regeneration is just something that we can't start in ourselves. It's a move of God to start this redemptive work in your heart. And he planned that from the beginning of time. Yes, he did. Justification is the moment where we realize, hey, wait a minute, we're we're justified before God. It's that moment when you say, oh, I've received Jesus Christ into my heart. I'm a new creation where we've repented of our sins and we follow. Sanctification is just the working out of all this over your lifetime. And glorification is it's the ultimate final state that we're going to be in when we're with Jesus Christ. So it's not super complicated, but again, it has to all be based on what? What Scripture says. And we realize what Scripture says and what, what, what people were created for is not just, to, okay, to have fun and do this and do that and be saved. People were created for the glory of God. And uh, something to think about how salvation plays into that whole picture. Here's where we would break for week two or part two, and we're just going to dive right into it because it's kind of a reiteration of the last slide of the previous week. Um, God's purpose of grace, what we believe, part two. So there's election and the overall process of election is what? Regeneration, we talked about last week. Justification, sanctification, glorification. We fully affirm that all this is God's work, not our own. We see that all true believers endure to the end. And, you know, different traditions might differ a little bit on this, but here's the thing. When you read scripture, you know, there are little things about here and there and And again, if you keep them in context, I think you'll still come to this conclusion that all believers will endure till the end. What God has saved is is saved. If you or or Chris is filming this right now, and he is his father's son, even if he was adopted as his father's son, guess what? He's his father's son. That's never going to change. Nothing's going to change that. Nothing Chris does is going to change that. And if his father is faithful, Chris is a son. His sister is the daughter. That doesn't change. That status will not change. And so scripture says, you know, we're, we're like adopted into that family. Guess what? <laughs> you are daughters and sons. Nothing is going to change that. There's endurance. Some bigger theological terms are that's perseverance of the saints. But whatever you call it, you're saved. And we don't have to have this worry all the time. Oh, I don't know if I'm saved. You know, I got to do all this stuff. The Korean church is terrible for that. It's all about feeling and all about this. And there's nothing wrong with feeling. Okay, I don't want to, you know, push that, that box too far away. But at the same time, you know, we can't earn in, in such a way for God to love us more. He already loves us as a father. And guess what? If you're a good father... Nothing your children do will make you love them more or love them less. Because they're your children. (laughs) We believe that God's choice, you know, it's God's choice. And there is a personal response. It's the day-to-day walk. It's important. Just like when my children were born into this world. They're, they're, They're my children. But in order for them to be obedient children, guess what? I can't make them be obedient children. (laughs) They got to make those choices on their own. And they need to be good sons on their own. So goes our walk with God. They may fall into temptation. Believers may fall into temptation. But uh, they will not fall away from the faith. 
And I pray that we would be on board with that together. Again, there are differing degrees on the, the extremity of all that. But overall, at the end of the day, we're saying that if you're saved, you're saved. If you're a child of God, you remain a child of God. What about those who might have seemed really genuine at beginning and you know, now if it, they're not coming to church anymore, or maybe they've even said, oh, you know, that all that Christian stuff is nonsense, and how can you believe those things? You guys are a bunch of bigots, and it almost feels like they're your enemy now. Here's the thing. Maybe, maybe they were never saved in the first place. Maybe they were caught up in one of those emotional moments. So when you kind of tell when you put your hand up, you know, all these tears are coming. It's all emotion. And there is a connection between emotions and the truth of what's going on, and reality. Of course there is, but if it's constantly driven by, I need to feel a certain way, or I need to agree with this part, and that doesn't agree with me, who's God? Like, seriously, who's the Lord of that type of person's life? And I don't want to come off as judgmental. That person may eventually come around, but only God knows. Only God knows. Only God knows if... If first place, you know, that he was chosen or she was chosen, right? Because God does the choosing. And only God knows if that person, that person's heart, truly. When we think about the last things on the slide, we see that there will be a literal return of Jesus Christ. That he will be in full glory. The dead will be raised. Christ will judge all people. It sounds like a kind of a, like a Ghostbusters. Oh, the dead will be raised. The seas will boil. The skies will split open, and judgment day will come. All right? And we we do believe that there will be a day when Jesus Christ comes in the flesh. I do not know exactly what it looks like. There are hints in the prophetic books, in Revelation, and whatnot. There there, there are hints, but we don't know. Uh, here are these guys trying to interpret and, and write down things that they were told and saw in dreams and stuff like that. And they're writing in the language and poetry of that day, which were really sketchy on anyways. And they're trying to explain things that are going on in the future. And then they're taken to the past and they don't know, you know, where's their context in all this? It's, it's not easy. But we do know one thing for certain that we're told Jesus Christ will come again. He said it himself. And he's going to be in glory. What does that look like? I think we get a little hint of it. Remember when he went up on the mount and he was transfigured? Peter, and, and, and they're, they're just blown away. They didn't know what to think or do. They just fell on their faces. We know that there is a judgment. Here's the thing, people. And you're like, oh, you just said, you know, God knows who he's going to say, but he uses people to reach out to people. We need to be obedient and be the best evangelist we can possibly be. Because the unrighteous will be banished to hell and the righteous will receive rewards in heaven. And you're like, well, well, where is it talked about in hell? Jesus Christ talked about hell more than any other person in the Bible, people. Just read the words and understand. You know, it's pretty serious stuff. Why would he talk about it all the time? Because he was very concerned. People who thought they were saved by their own righteousness. He's the harshest on those people. Today he would come and he'd be the harshest on the people in the church. Baptism. We're a Baptist church, but that's not why we baptize. You know, we baptize because Scripture says, <laughs> be baptized. Jesus Christ says, baptizing them in the name. You know, it's part of our evangelism process. It's part of our growing process as Christians. It's part of becoming a Christian. Baptized in the Spirit, yes. And the outworking, the physical representat representation of, of what has occurred. It's symbolic. Baptism by immersion in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's biblical. Right? We're baptizing not in the name of a certain pastor or a certain church or just some random entity out there, the biblical triune God. It's an act of obedience symbolizing faith in a buried and risen Savior, death to sin, burial of old life, resurrection and walk, to walk in the newness of life in Jesus, testimony to faith and final resurrection of the dead. It's pretty serious stuff, it is. But here's the thing, if, you're bap if you become a Christian, you know, we're going to tell the whole world that Jesus lives. What an amazing picture that baptism would do. What amazing representation of what's happened to you through Christ Jesus. How we're going into the water, we're going, we're, and we're coming, it represents that burial and death and hopelessness and lostness. 
Hopefully you're not held down there too long. <laughs> but we come out, and we, it's this representation of coming out of the waters into new life. We remember that Jesus in the River Jordan was baptized. you got to just look into the original languages to know that. If you've been sprinkled, it's okay. <laughs> as long as you've made that public confession that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, and you realize that the, 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 the representation of the washing away of your sins coming into new life. You're declaring that to people. And here's the thing. If you've been baptized as a baby, you couldn't do that as a baby. Babies aren't like, oh, you're going to stand up and go, ah, Jesus Christ, the Lord, Savior, right? And I'm going to follow him all days of my life. And here's my testimony. You're not doing that as a baby. I encourage you, you know, certain traditions, they'll say, okay, you know, we did that as a baby, and um, now that we're older, we've made a confession of faith publicly. I'm, well, okay. Uh, but if you're going to become a, a deacon at our church, if you're going to um, become a pastor at our church and whatnot and those types of things, right, we, we ask that you be dunked. And it's not just like, oh, you know, am I resaved? No, that, that, that's, the baptism doesn't save you. It's a representation, and you're telling people that this is what has happened. And it's just part of uh, the obedient life um, and also part of that life here at this church. So we encourage you, if you've been baptized as an infant, made the confession, it's okay. Uh, if you haven't been baptized, you need to be baptized. And we will dunk you here. <laughs> and if you're um, baptized as a baby and haven't made that confession, uh, again, we'll, we'll dunk you here as well, just to make that confession and, and experience the symbolism of all that that has happened. Lord's Supper. Did you know that as Baptists, you know, we have those two ordinances. One is baptism, the other is the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a symbolic act of obedience, partaking as part of the body of Christ. We're remembering his act of obedience on the cross, his blood shed, his body broken. And we're declaring that we'll follow him faithfully till his return. Uh, he, we're not about transubstantiation. We don't think that the blood, you know, the, the wine or we're a Baptist church, the grape juice, if you let it ferment a bit. Anyways, um, but it, we, we, we're we not all about, okay, it becomes the literal blood for that second that it goes into your body. Nor are we about, okay, the bread, you know, it's the literal flesh of Jesus once it goes into your body and those types of things. But we realize what Jesus Christ commanded us. Do this in remembrance of me, how his body was broken as he hung on that tree, how his blood was shed, that there would be life for you and me. Right? So we think about these things. We remember, and we don't do it just like once, you know, once every blue moon or whatnot. We, we try to do it regularly. Because church, yeah, it's not a somber experience. It isn't. But we need to remember what it took, that pain, that suffering. And we're declaring to the world that we'll follow him until the day of his return. People, if you haven't partaken in the Lord's Supper and you call yourself a Christian, we're talking about membership here. and We're assuming that you know, you've received Jesus Christ into your heart as Lord and Savior. And that's, that's been part of the class. It's part of your small groups and whatnot. But if we declared those things and we're just all about, oh, you know, we get together on Sundays and our Friday night small groups and that's great. We need to remember what Jesus Christ has done and we need to do it in community. And here we are, the Lord's Supper, partaking of the body, remembering Jesus' blood shed, his body broken, and declaring we will follow until his return. And that is it for the theology portion. Of course, there are a lot of things that we believe that aren't mentioned here, but as part of the membership class, we're just touching all the bases. And if you're on board with all these things, which you should be, that's what we teach at this church. That's where all the sermons on Sunday, they're, they're rooted in Scripture, and Scripture kind of says these things, uh, pretty important things. And that you're a Bible study leader, small group leaders, Friday night leaders, uh, youth pastor, Chris, <laughs> Um, children's pastor, Pastor Daniel, Pastor Sue, we, uh, we, we, if you're in a teaching position, you, you'll hold to these things steadfastly and we'll do our very best not to deviate from them because, again, it's not just because, oh, it's what this church teaches, but it's because it's what scripture says. And uh, that we say with conviction and that is, you know, something we want to be united in as we can grow together in love. 
All right, that's it for the theological portion of this membership course. And we will see you on Sunday.